Okay, it looks like we're ready to go. So I've got a few announcements to make before we get started uh, with the actual content. Again, uh, those of you that are coming in, nice to see you all. Um, we had our quiz uh, last week. Most of you have taken the quiz. I know there's a few of you that uh, I did a, an SRA, uh, so you will be, uh, th there'll be a makeup quiz for that. Uh, if you're waiting for me to contact you about the makeup quiz, I will be doing that shortly. Uh, I was hoping to get to that earlier this week, which I didn't, uh, but there will be a makeup quiz if you missed it because of your self-reported absence. So don't worry about uh, any of that. Um, a number of you contacted me and said it did seem like it was really fast, uh, a lot of questions. So I'll either increase the amount of time for the next quiz or decrease the amount of questions, probably decrease the amount of questions uh, and leave it 15 minutes. So I don't exactly know how much I'll decrease it to some, what was it, 20 questions? So somewhere between 20 and 15, maybe more towards the 15 direction, I think might be a little bit more reasonable. I'm just trying to make it so that it is uh, a challenge, sort of, but not like an anxiety causing challenge. So I will reduce that a little bit and we'll see how the next one goes. Uh, second thing, uh, it was run on OWL. Did you all find that to be okay? Or was that a little frustrating? OWL was good enough. How do you feel about doing the exam on OWL though? A hundred questions or so, or however many, two hours or whatever the thing is, is that gonna be okay? Or would you prefer something more like a Qualtrics interface? I think that might be better, but it makes it a little bit more challenging to deal with different time things. So maybe we'll just stick you, everybody's giving me the okay with OWL. Okay, fine, we'll just leave it like that. Yeah, you had a question. Uh, just something to chat. They might have something. Oh, somebody might have, oh yeah, somebody might have some questions. Thanks for. Two point five. yeah, that was just the question. So the question was, uh, what is the, uh, yeah, quizzes are worth 2.5%. So it's not a large proportion, but they do add up, right? There's four of them. So eventually it does become a significant part of your mark. So if you underperformed where you thought you would like to or where you would like to on that first quiz, don't worry too much. It's only 2.5% uh, of your grade. In theory, you could get a zero on it and still end up with a grade in the 90s, right? If you do well on everything else. So uh, it's just a small component. Uh, the next one will be in two weeks, I think, uh, because we've got some content this week on memory, next week on memory. Uh, then we've got another short quiz and a review session, and then uh, exam number one right before uh, the break. So we will have a little bit shorter amount of time between the two things uh, uh, than, the, than the first uh, session. Any other questions on the quiz or the exam coming up? Yes. Will the next quiz only be on like what we're learning from now until then, or will it be like tomorrow? just from what we're learning from now till then? Uh, so quizzes and exams are both going to be the same way. So the quiz will only cover the stuff since the last quiz. Uh, so in other words, stuff from today uh, through that uh, first quiz day. Uh, same thing with the exam. It'll cover the first half. Then you'll go home on your reading week. Uh, and then you'll come back. And the second exam covers only that second half of the class. So we've kind of divided the class up. Into two um, OK, so let's get uh, started with the uh, content. We've got two lectures this week on memory. Um, get back here, I'm going to hide this thing. Uh, let's hide the loading meeting controls. Okay, and now I can go back here to click on the thing. And there we go. So we've got some content on memory. Uh, today is going to be a basic description of what we're going to talk about. We'll talk a little bit in general about how to define memory, what it might be separate from perception, attention, and knowledge. Uh, we'll define different concepts around memory. Uh, so we'll talk a little bit about the distinction between implicit and explicit memory, which we will come back to again. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about uh, encoding and retrieval. So this will be sort of an overview of some of the topics we'll continue to discuss. We'll talk a little bit about encoding. Uh, we'll cover the content on working memory and the working memory model will be covered in the online lecture. Where is that online lecture, you might ask yourself? Well, it's not up yet because I didn't record it yet because I just can't get my head around the fact that it's already Wednesday. Uh, it'll be up before the end of the week. So I'll probably do some set aside some time tomorrow to record that lecture. Uh, you'll find it before the end of the week in any event. So either tomorrow or uh, Friday. Uh, week seven next week, we'll then continue on with retrieval and memory errors uh, and the trustworthiness of memory. So one of the things that I mentioned uh, in the textbook uh, is 
said, uh, or in, in my textbook for a different class, sorry, uh, is that memory is not designed to remember specific facts and details, right? So what we've evolved uh, as our memory systems, which evolved from simple associations that you can see in non-human animals, uh, is a system that allows us to generalize and not to remember specific facts. Of course, we want our memory to be accurate. Right? We want, you usually want your memory to be uh, able to remember specific things. I'm sure there's lots of times when you're frustrated that you can't remember the thing that you want to remember. So we kind of like for our memories to be perfect, but it's not designed that way. It was never designed uh, to remember specific facts. And the reason is, and this is true across uh, all sorts of species, there's not a lot of evolutionary or adaptive advantage to being able to remember one specific thing. So a perfect record of the past can be useful, but it isn't that useful, right? Maybe it's good for an exam to be able to remember all the things that you studied, but in terms of navigating through the world, uh, maybe it's not as useful as you think. Your memory instead, and we'll discuss this today, we'll discuss this next week, is designed to generalize things, to categorize things, uh, and to predict things. So the goal of memory isn't just to remember things, it's to help you do things and to plan for the future. Your memory is mostly something that you use to plan for the future. We think of it as the past, but really your memory is more of a future-oriented uh, system. So we really need our memories to be flexible. When your memory fails and you remember things that are inaccurate, maybe you elaborate on a story or you remember some new details that weren't actually there if you're telling somebody something. Uh, that's actually useful because you kind of want your memory to be able to predict and help you plan for the future. Just remembering something perfectly uh, may not be uh, what you need. So we want our memories to be flexible and to stretch the truth because that's sort of the essence of learning for most of us. Let's talk about uh, a list of all the ways memory can go wrong. Uh, so we're going to come back to this next week when we talk about memory failures, but I want, to, I want you to keep this in mind. Uh, this is from, a art, from an article that was published in 1999. It came out of Daniel Schachter's uh, APA address. Uh, so uh, Daniel Schachter's work we're going to talk more about next week uh, is a cognitive neuroscientist uh, who studies memory. Uh, explicit memory, implicit memory, procedural memories, uh, also has studied a lot about the interaction between the brain uh, and memory. One of the things he suggested is we got at least seven good ways that our memory fails. Uh, a lot of these are things that we're all familiar with. And they fall into sort of, uh, these seven things fall into several categories. So the first of them we're gonna call is transience. Uh, so Schachter defines transience as the tendency to lose access to information across time, whether through forgetting, interference, or retrieval failure. So memory is never going to be a perfect record. It's always going to be transient. Sometimes you just forget, sometimes you interfere, uh, and sometimes things fade. Uh, there's also a second uh, related failure, uh, which we can refer to as absent-mindedness. And this is one that uh, you were probably all guilty of. I'm really guilty of this because, you know, it's kind of a stereotype of a professor, right? Somebody who is not always remembering things. An absent-minded professor is kind of a stereotype. Um, everyday memory, memory failures in remembering information, uh, intended activities. So that's kind of a future-oriented failure, right? I forgot what I was supposed to do, not what I did. Uh, and that's the kind of absent-mindedness that most of us are familiar with. Probably caused by insufficient attention or superficial automatic processing during encoding. Uh, how many of you have been in a situation, maybe it's a classroom situation or everyday life where you think about something you need to do when you're talking to someone. Then you go to a different room or you go to a different class or you leave the classroom and you have no memory of making that plan, right? You forget because you didn't write it down or maybe you didn't uh, encode it. I do this all the time. I'll be meeting with a student or I'll be meeting with a colleague. We'll discuss some plans and I'll walk back to my office and I will have forgotten what I said I was going to do, which is probably why when you might ask me, 
uh, a question about something related to the class, I almost always respond with, please email me. Uh, because when I get back to my office, I'm probably forgetting to get what we talked about. It's not because I didn't care. It's just because there's a contextual absent mindedness. I didn't put enough effort into trying to remember it. And sometimes those little uh, cues like an email can help. Uh, blocking is another failure of memory. Uh, this is the temporary retrieval failure or loss uh, that's very specific to a particular fact. We might talk about it as the tip of the tongue state. Um, there are, you probably all know what I'm talking about when I say tip of the tongue, right? Where you feel that you can almost retrieve the information. You can almost remember the answer to the question so much so that you can almost feel yourself saying the answer, but you just can't quite get it. So you know you know it your metacognition or your awareness of your own memory tells you, I do have that fact. I know it, but I can't retrieve the answer. Uh, that's an example of blocking, which is different from absent-mindedness. It's different from transience. In other words, the fact is there, you encoded it properly, but for whatever reason, you can't access it. It's being blocked. So those are three kinds of failures that all do with, have to do with forgetting information or not being able to retrieve the right information. In other words, it was never stored, in absent mindedness, uh, it kind of faded in transience or it was actively blocked. Uh, the next three uh, kinds of, of failures have to do with making stuff up essentially. So this is the case where your memory adds information or gets something wrong. So it isn't just that you forget, it's that you remember things in the wrong way. Misattribution. Uh, you remember something, but you attribute it to the wrong source. So this is when you remember something, but you don't remember who told you. Uh, it happens all the time, right? You remember seeing something, but you don't remember where. Uh, you remember somebody telling you something, but you don't remember who told you. Uh, so this kind of misattribution has to do with uh, not encoding uh, the correct connections between the person or the source and the content or the fact. It happens often when the fact is something that's either really unusual or really common, uh, and you don't closely associate it with the person who told you uh, or the place you learned it. Suggestibility is related to this, and it's a tendency to incorporate information provided by others into your own recollection. We'll talk a lot more about this in two weeks when we talk about memory errors uh, in more detail. But uh, things like misattribution and suggestibility are where these, where a lot of our mistakes come from. Right? People might add, question you in a particular way about something, and then you're not sure of what you remembered. Uh, or maybe you're not quite sure of the contents of your memory. Uh, or maybe you're not quite sure of all of the individual facts. Or maybe you tell yourself. Uh, new information when you're telling a story to someone. I'm sure we've all been in that situation where we're telling somebody something funny that happened and they're laughing and you add more detail than what actually happened. Uh, then the next time you tell the story, you don't tell what happened, you tell the funny story, right? And the more time you tell the funny story, the more that becomes part of the memory. And so what really happened and what you talk about what happened become the same thing. Right? And so it becomes difficult to then disambiguate what really happened to you and what you think happened and what you tell yourself happened and what you tell other people uh, what happened. When people say they're not sure of the facts or they don't exactly remember, sometimes that's what you mean. You know something happened, but you don't remember all the details because you've told the story in lots of different ways. And you now don't remember which parts of the parts you added uh, and which parts of the parts someone else added. Uh, this also comes out in bias. We have a tendency for knowledge and beliefs uh, and feelings to distort the, re the recollection of previous events uh, in a way that affects our current uh, uh, current experiences. So we remember some things more strongly than others, and that might affect uh, the way in which you interact with people. If you had a negative experience with somebody once, uh, that might be something that comes to mind more often uh, than all of the positive times uh, you've, uh, you've interacted with. This is going to come back several times in this class. First of all, when we talk about memory errors, later when we talk about reasoning and decision making and judgment, we're going to talk about all the different kinds of cognitive heuristics and biases that people show. And often they come down to this idea. 
uh, that we remember something, but maybe we remember a specific event that influences our behavior uh, in ways that we don't always realize. So you remember a positive or a negative event or a low probability event uh, is going to affect the way in which you judge the current probability. Finally, this last one uh, is not really, it's kind of on its own here with this failure list of failures and sins of memory. And that's the tendency to just not forget things. Uh, there's probably lots of things you'd like to forget, whether they're things that were unhappy that happened to you or unfortunate events that happened or just useless facts that you really are not help. <laughs> you're not being helped by remembering, right? Uh, they just persist. Uh, and the more times you think of them, the stronger the trace gets, right? Uh, you cannot make yourself forget something. You can make yourself learn something. You can cause yourself to remember something by rehearsing it. We'll talk about that uh, in the online lab. Uh, but it's really difficult to make yourself forget something because as soon as you think of the thing you wanna forget, you've now reinforced the trace a little bit more. So sometimes we'd like our memories to not be as persistent as they are uh, because we can make room for new connections and we can forget things that bothered us. Uh, and we can potentially undermine or reduce some of the biases if we could not remember specific facts. Okay, so those are the seven sins of memories as described by Daniel Schachter. Seven ways in which uh, the complexity of our memory system uh, sometimes causes us to make mistakes or changes our behaviors uh, or causes us to judge things in ways that deviate from rationality or deviate from the underlying probability. Let's talk a little bit about the basic operations of memory. So irrespective of the ways in which memory might let you down, how does memory actually work? I wanna talk about three different things. Uh, and this will, we'll use these terms throughout the next two or three weeks. Encoding, storage, and retrieval. So memory is all about encoding information, storing information, and then retrieving information. Now I'm describing them as three operations. Your memory is doing all three of them, uh, usually simultaneously. As you encode things, it interacts with things that you've already stored, which means you're retrieving things to help you encode them in the first place, right? So this is not a static uh, state. We're gonna describe at the end of today, a model of memory uh, that assumes these are static phases, that there's an encoding phase separate from a storage phase. But that's really just a convenience to talk about the processes that are most dominant during those, uh, those processes. So encoding just means putting things in your memory, uh, perceiving information, attending to information in the world, and encoding the information. In other words, extracting features uh, and extracting uh, you know, whether the primitive visual features or primitive verbal features. Most of the research on encoding, which is what we're going to talk a lot about today and to, uh, in the online lecture, has to do with the attentional and processing limits. So as we've shown in our attention and our perception lectures, there's only so much you can pay attention to, right? You can perceive everything that's in front of you or sense everything that's in front of you, but it takes you uh, it takes a few milliseconds to be able to label those things and to extract the features. And as you start to decompose the visual scene, you lose access to the things that you haven't paid attention to. Uh, so you go from a complete uh, input to something that's limited. So there are limits at the attentional level and at the processing level for the encoding. So you can only encode what you're trying to encode or what you're able to pay attention to or what you're able to perceive. We'll talk in a little bit about some implicit incidental encoding, but it still assumes that you're seeing these things or hearing these things. So that's encoding, all of the different processes that involve uh, taking information from the outside world and putting it into an information form uh, that allows you to process it further for your long-term memory, which we refer to as storage. Uh, storage is a bit of a metaphor here. Uh, it is it isn't really the case that there's one place uh, in your brain where you store a, a whole complete memory, right? A memory is stored by uh, connections between millions of neurons and other millions of neurons, and those connections get strengthened. The strengthening of the connections is the memory. 
right? So the more time a certain act, state of activation occurs, uh, the stronger that memory gets. And you can recreate that state of activation and re-experience the event as if you're remembering it. Uh, so it, it, we can talk about it like storage, because that's a convenient metaphor. Uh, we write something down and put it in a drawer, or you uh, type something and store it on your computer hard drive. That's a metaphor that works pretty well uh, in the physical world, and we can continue to use it uh, in the cognitive uh, world as well. Uh, this can be memory for procedures, facts, and so on, uh, whether they're uh, motor behaviors, facts about the world, facts about yourself, things that happened yesterday, events, uh, and so on. These are all things that are going to be stored. But we need to use them, so we need to be able to retrieve them. Uh, in many cases, remembering things involves uh, explicitly trying to recall some information. That's what you do when you're taking an exam, right? Uh, you explicitly try to remember the answer to a question. Or if somebody asks you, what did you do yesterday? Uh, you explicitly try to recount the events that happened yesterday. Uh, that's an explicit recall, but there's lots of implicit recall where uh, your behavior is influenced by things that happened in the past. You're not always aware of how those things work, uh, but it is it's still a recall of some sort, right? Uh, it's reusing information that happened in the past to help you get better at doing something uh, in, from, in the future. So these are the three basic operations. You encode information using attention and perception. You store information in neural networks and spreading activation systems. And you retrieve information by reactivating those and behaving towards things appropriately uh, as predicted by uh, your memory. So memory is not a single process. Uh, there are lots of different ways to talk about how our memory uh, influences our behavior. Uh, there are more than one way. Uh, to describe. Sometimes we think about short-term memory and long-term memory. We think about explicit memory and implicit memory, or memory for facts, or memory for events. Uh, let's talk about all the different divisions, and we'll use this to sort of frame some of our additional uh, discussions. So here is a plot that sort of shows historically, or at least in the current, uh, maybe the last uh, 20 years or so, uh, that describes the different ways in which psychologists have studied memory. Does this mean that these are all the possible ways in which memory can be described? No. Uh, does this mean that all of these are uniquely separate? No, it doesn't either. It just suggests that these are ways in which we can measure, study, and understand how our memory works and how it influences our behavior. The biggest distinction that we'll see uh, today and in other lectures is the distinction between explicit memory and implicit memory. These explicit memories are the memories that we are able to be explicitly conscious of. Uh, so these are things that we can declare the existence of. We can say that we have this in our memory. Uh, we can make a point to remember something. Uh, we can try to learn something and encode it. Uh, we, can ex we can retrieve it. This is often uh, described as one of two kinds of memory. Again, these interact with each other, uh, but we can talk about memory for personal events in the past, present, and future. We refer to that as episodic memory. So it's kind of a mental time travel. When you think what happened over the long weekend, so if you try to remember, you know, what did you do over the Thanksgiving weekend? Uh, you might sit for a minute and then sort of think backwards about all of the things that happened, right? Uh, you can actually entertain yourself that way, right? You can think about something that happened a few years ago, remember when, and then you can go on with a long story about something. Uh, that episodic memory allows us to go back in time, but it also allows us to go forward in time. The same process that allows you to think about something that happened allows you to think about something that will happen. All of us have this capability, right? You can think about what you're gonna be doing uh, an hour from now. Uh, when this class is over, you can think about what your next class is going to be, or are you going to get a cup of coffee, or are you going to be walking back to your apartment? Uh, are you gonna go for a run or something like that? You can plan ahead. Uh, we can think about where we're gonna be next week. So we can move forwards and backwards in time using this uh, episodic memory system. But at the same time, we have a semantic memory system, which is a memory for facts that isn't tied to any particular place or time or person. Uh, when you think about uh, facts that you learn in this class or in any class, 
uh, you're not usually thinking about yourself learning them, right? You're just trying to get through the exam. Uh, when you think about all the facts that you know, whether it's people in your family or facts that you learned about uh, where places are or what things are, uh, all of these are what we refer to as semantic memory. The knowledge structures that we talked about uh, last week, the concepts and the categories and the hierarchical knowledge structures, those are all examples of semantic long-term memory. We don't remember how they got there. Uh, you probably don't, for most of them, have a specific memory for an episode when you learned uh, that something was part of uh, a certain kind of dog was uh, bigger than another kind of dog or uh, differences between different kinds of birds uh, that we were talking about. So all that semantic memory, you probably don't have a memory for a specific thing. Uh, so these are our explicit memories, but we also have lots of implicit memories, which are a little bit harder to think about and a little bit harder to describe because we don't, we're not usually aware of. Them. Uh, but there's at least four ways in which our memory affects our behavior without us knowing about it. Uh, first of all, procedural memories, knowing how to do things. Uh, we use these every single day, and sometimes we can describe them as being procedural memories. Other times we describe them as being motor memories. Uh, those of you that are typing without looking at your hands, uh, you're using a procedural memory for touch typing, right? Those of you that are writing things down with a pen or a pencil, procedural memories for how to write things. Uh, I don't have to think each time about how I, you know, I need to press the right hand key to advance and the left one uh, to go back. So those procedural memories are things that our motor system knows how to do. Similarly, uh, the grammatical laws, uh, the rules rather, that define the, the languages that you speak. You learn those things procedurally. You know what words are supposed to come next and which words can't come next. You can tell the difference between somebody saying something that's grammatically clear and not grammatically clear. You know those rules, even though you don't know where you learned them. Uh, you probably can't articulate them. You can't explain them out loud, uh, but you still know them. An example of a procedural memory. Uh, these are all skills. Priming is another example. And this is something that comes up when we talk about the heuristics and the biases that we all have. Uh, things that have happened in the past change the way we treat people in the future, uh, sometimes without us realizing it. Right? Uh, situations, we might approach some situations differently based on our prior knowledge, based on our prior experience, but we're not always aware of how that prior experience affects our judgments and affects our decisions. So changes in how you perceive and believe and judge things uh, based on your memory without necessarily knowing which memories are contributing uh, to those changes in behavior. That's an Oh, the battery cut out. So, in case you're wondering why uh, my voice is hold on for me. Hey, my bet. I'm good. I'm back on. I don't have the sort of with this mask on. There's no way I can project the whole way back there. So I kind of have to have the microphone on. Um, okay. So where were we? Priming, uh, per perceptual learning is a different kind of priming. We're going to talk about next week, uh, where you can learn to perceive things better the more times you see them. Uh, so this is an example of a perceptual. Uh, a perceptual advantage for having seen something before. You're not always aware of having seen it. Uh, you may not be aware of how it's helping you perceive things, but you can read things faster and you can listen to things better the more times you've listened to them, the more times you've seen them, and the more times you've read them. Uh, finally, classical conditioning. We don't often think about classical conditioning as a form of memory. Classical conditioning, of course, is the association of one stimulus with another stimulus, right? The, co-occurrence of two stimuli, uh, one begins to predict the other. Uh, so when we think about those examples like uh, hearing a bell or a sound and then an animal predicts that they're gonna be fed, right? Uh, so when I feed the cat at home, uh, she knows that if we're getting ready for dinner, uh, there's gonna be her dinner is coming. So she comes running around the corner. If you pick up the dish that we get fed in and it sort of makes a certain sound when it moves along the countertop, she can recognize that sound from anywhere in the house, knowing that her dish is going to be filled up. That's a classical conditioning. She doesn't think about it 
but she knows the association between those two things. Also a form of memory. Let's talk a little bit more about each one of these dis uh, distinctions. Uh, so the distinction between Ex between the explicit declarative memory and the explicit non or the implicit non declarative memories. Uh, these are all different kinds of facts based on a content division. So when we study uh, the difference between declarative memory and non declarative memory, we're studying the difference between the contents of those memories and how we can access them. So declarative memories we've talked about, we referred to on the previous slide as explicit memories. Uh, they are things that you know you have access to. You can declare the existence of them. Endel Tulving, who was the uh, psychologist most uh, associated with this distinction between declarative and non-declarative memory, episodic and semantic memory, uh, suggests that these semantic memories for facts and these episodic memories for events are things that we are explicitly aware of. We don't always get them right. We don't always get the details right, but we know that we know them. Right, And when we uh, talk about things that happened in the past, we're explicitly trying to uh, be aware of them, as opposed to these non-declarative procedural and motor memories. So this distinction between declarative and non-declarative is a distinction of content. We're dividing memory up into what's inside the memory representation. Uh, we can also divide these memory kinds up into the encoding processes that are used. Uh, there are lots of different ways to encode information. Oftentimes, we're intentionally trying to encode things, whether it's procedural memory uh, or whether it is uh, explicit declarative or semantic memory or episodic memory. There's lots of different kinds of memories that you can explicitly or intentionally try to uh, acquire, whether it's learning a list of words, studying, uh, trying to learn something, or learning a new skill, right? The kind of motor memory that we might not be able to declare the existence of, you're often still trying to learn. So if you've ever, how many of you have practiced learning how to play an instrument of some kind, like the piano or the guitar or something like that? So you try to do it, right? There's a lot of motor memory there, which you are explicitly and intentionally trying to encode. Uh, now, of course, you encode a lot of things incidentally or unintentionally just learning by association and exposure. Uh, my cat who learned the association between the sound of the dish on the counter and the food that's coming right after did not set out to learn that connection, right? Uh, it just happened enough and she put the, the two things together and knew that one was gonna always predict the other. Um, so learning by association. And when you learn the rules of the grammar of the languages that you speak, uh, most of that you're learning incidentally. Uh, certainly your native language you're learning incidentally. Uh, lots of exposure to it, and so you acquire those forms. Even a second or a third language which you've tried to learn, a lot of that grammar is being learned incidentally. You learn songs or uh, any, any other kind of uh, discourse or a film or remembering a, a video clip or something, often that's gonna happen incidentally without really trying to learn it you'll hear it enough times that you know these songs, uh, songs that play sort of in the back. Um, so encoding requires some kind of attention. If we want to encode some information, uh, if you want to try to intentionally encode something, you've got to pay attention to the information. Right? So in this class, if you want to attend, uh, pay attention or learn some of the information, you're trying to write it down or you're trying to pay attention or you're uh, encoding this information deliberately. Uh, we need, I don't know why it says or cocktail party effect. Oh, I guess I meant to say like, or something happens that diverts your attention. So whether you try to pay attention, I can't remember why I put the word or in there. I think I thought that it was important at some point, but I don't remember why I thought it was important now. Um, so you either have to put attention on there or attention is put on the object for you by someone drawing your attention to it. So if something happens in the periphery and you turn to look at it, then you can uh, divert your attention uh, and help to encode that information. But lots of things like the imagery that we talked about two weeks ago, we suggested that a lot of imagistic information in mental images and visual images are encoded incidentally without trying, right? I never once have tried to encode the information like 
uh, my car's uh, dashboard. Oh. So if you have a car, do you think you could confident, would you be confident in your ability to draw all of the details on the dashboard? Probably not. Uh, I certainly would be. I wouldn't even be confident to be able to recognize a picture of my dashboard from a different model uh, dashboard or someone else's. Uh, can you confidently recognize or draw the desktop icons on your laptop that are on the bottom if you have a Mac, for example, or on the start uh, menu if you have a PC? Probably not. The home screen on your phone? Probably not. Uh, there's a lot of things that you see every day that you never spent time trying to encode those particular details. Um, we've all seen uh, Canadian flags. How many points are on the Canadian flag? How many? Does anybody know the answer? Nobody knows the answer to, how, to what our flag looks like, but you could recognize the flag instantly, right? I mean, you've probably seen a Canadian flag icon. Uh, thousands and thousands of times, right? It's not something that's uncommon. Uh, but most of us don't really know the answer to that. How many of you are trying to answer it by imagining the flag? Who wants to make a guess? 12. 12? Like if, you count the stem, yeah. if you count the stem, you'd get 12. If you don't count the stem, uh, you get 11. Uh, this is the actual Canadian flag. There's lots of Canadian maple leaf flag like images out there, depending on whether or not you're talking about the Leafs or Air Canada. Uh, but this is the official Canadian flag, Maple Leaf. There's 11 points. I've seen this countless times, right? There's no way I could even remember how many times I've seen a Canadian flag. Uh, and even though I've used this example in class before, I'm never 100% sure what the answer is until I look at it. Uh, it's 11, right? 12, as you said, if you wanted to count the stem at the bottom as a point, which we can uh, agree or disagree. Uh, either way, that's the right answer. You've seen this a lot of times. You probably never thought to encode that piece of information. You could probably recognize a legitimate Canadian flag from a non-standard uh, Canadian flag if they were side by side. Uh, but if you saw a non-standard flag uh, with the wrong number of points, you might not even know that it was a non-standard flag, right? Uh, so this is an example of incidental encoding. We know what the flag looks like, but we don't really count the number of points on it every time we see it. Uh, my guess is that if in a year somebody asked you how many points are out of Canadian maple leaf, many of us would not remember the answer. Even though you might remember having been asked it once in a class, you might remember the episode of, oh yeah, I remember we used that as a class example, but I'm not 100% sure how many, uh, how many points there are on the maple leaf. It's just not a piece of information that happens to be encodable incidentally. Uh, there's different ways to retrieve information. And so this largely breaks down uh, between that implicit and explicit distinction we saw on the slide before. Uh, we can explicitly or try to retrieve the information. And this is something that you can do uh, clearly with semantic and episodic memories, right? You try to remember what happened. Uh, you can also try to remember how to do certain procedural things, right? You can say, I'm going to try to remember how to do this. I haven't used this tool for a while. And so maybe you're trying to remember some of the motions. Um, but a lot, of, a lot of times you remember things without being aware of it, or you remember things without trying. So information influences your performance, uh, sometimes outside of your awareness, outside of your consciousness. Um, so how long is our memory? So we can, we've talked about divisions of content, uh, divisions of uh, encoding and retrieval and effort. Uh, another encode, another distinction in memory is the length. Uh, and this is probably the one that you're the most familiar with. This is probably the one that most of us are familiar with when we think about kinds of memory. Uh, we think of short-term memory and long-term memory. Uh, and in the cognitive psychology literature, in the cognitive neuroscience literature, that's been a long-standing distinction, that there seems to be something different about the kind of memory that's short-term, uh, that's not going to ever stay, uh, it's not going to become part of your long-lasting semantic neural network, uh, and information that's long-term, that stays with you over the long haul, whether it's facts or episodes. Um, we've already talked about this one up here, sensory memory. That was that iconic sensory memory that 
for a brief period, less than a second, you can sort of have access to everything that's in front of you, but it fades too quickly uh, to be able to remember. Um, what we're more, we're gonna talk a little bit more about for the last, I guess 10 minutes is all we have left for today. Uh, for the last 10 minutes uh, is the short-term and the long-term working memory. Uh, so short-term memory is what you expect it to be, right? It's the memory that lasts only uh, for a few seconds unless you actively work at keeping it active. Uh, so in a lot of studies, which we'll discuss today and also online, uh, will suggest that the maximum uh, capacity for this short-term system is about seven things. Uh, you can remember seven digits, seven numbers, seven letters, seven words, seven countries, uh, seven names. But beyond that, it sort of reaches uh, its capacity. And the capacity seems to be based on the amount of time it takes you to get through that list of seven. By the time you get through a list bigger than seven things, seven ideas or seven syllables or uh, wow. seven names, uh, it starts to fade. So the working memory requires some conscious effort to be able to say the things to yourself, to use an inner voice uh, or to use an inner eye to be able to imagine looking at something. So you need those imagery-based systems uh, to keep that information active. So it's a short-term memory and it seems to store seven plus or minus two chunks of information. Our long-term memory, on the other hand, which is everything else we've been talking about, whether it's uh, procedural memory, semantic memory, or episodic memory, uh, doesn't really seem to have any uh, practical limit, right? There's no, it's not like you can get to a limit of things that you can't remember new stuff. It just starts to be integrated with everything else that you know. Uh, in fact, the more things you know, the easier it is to learn new things uh, because you have a rich semantic network into which to fit those new facts. Uh, so the more facts that you know, the more connections that you have, uh, the richer those representations are going to be. I want to uh, then discuss briefly this basic modal model of memory. Uh, so this modal model of memory defines the short and long-term systems as being separate from each other. Uh, they're not really separate from each other. There's going to be interactions uh, between the short-term system and the long-term system. But it's easier to study short-term memory when we think about it in isolation from its access to long-term memory. So a lot of the research around how your short-term and working memory model system works uh, has to do with separating it from long-term memory. So what you'll see is research looking at people remembering uh, uh, people remembering short lists of letters or lists of words or lists of numbers uh, and so on. This is closely associated uh, with Atkinson and Schifrin, who did this work uh, in the late 1960s early 1970s and continued to refine the model throughout the 1980s. For the most part, a lot of the research we're gonna talk about uh, over uh, the rest of today's class, the online classes and next week, uh, will work with stuff that happened uh, in the 1980s, uh, sort of the golden age of memory psychology. Uh, once we get to the cognitive neuroscience uh, content, a lot more of that information will be um, um, so this talks about how we acquire memories and how we store them. And the suggestion is that we've got this early analysis. We've already talked about how this works, right? We've talked about uh, these iconic memories or these echoic memories uh, and pulling features out and extracting features. Um, the suggestion from the modal model uh, is that we have a short-term memory store. This short-term memory store allows us to keep things active. Right, And that's what you do when somebody gives you a list of information and you need to temporarily remember it uh, until you can write it down somewhere else. Uh, the standard example that a lot of psychologists have used in the past is something like a phone number. Uh, but most of us don't use phone numbers very much. Uh, we don't have to remember phone numbers as much uh, because you have most of that information uh, in your smartphone. There's a handful of times you have to do it. Uh, maybe a better example is the times when you have to uh, use multi-factor authentication, right? Uh, you get a code that's texted to your phone, which you can then uh, type into a box in order to access some information. So you briefly have to remember a seven-digit number or a five-digit number. You say it to yourself until you write it down, 
at which point it's gone from your memory, right? I don't know how many times I've gotten this five digit code every time I log into something, but I don't remember the number, obviously. I only remember it as long as I need it until I can mentally copy and paste it into what I need, and then it's gone from my memory. Uh, so this is a system that allows you to keep copying something, keep refreshing it, uh, actively maintaining it by using an inner voice and saying it to yourself until you've either lost it or you've put it in your long-term memory. So either you don't need it anymore and then it fades, or you do need it and you have to continue to rehearse it. When you probably learned facts in high school or even elementary school prior to that, you probably used a technique like this to study for quizzes and tests, right? Where you would just remember or memorize facts. How many of you went through classes like first year biology or chemistry courses where you had to just learn a lot of basic vocabulary for those topics, right? Sometimes that's the only way to do it. It's just to keep memorizing those facts uh, until you've committed them to memory and they start to reinforce each other. Um, and then you can remember them uh, for longer. But if you don't use them, they do eventually start to fade a little bit. Um, so let's finish. We're going to, I've got more slides here than I can get through. Let's finish briefly with a description of serial position. And then I'll work some of this into the online uh, lecture. Uh, that we're going to, that I'm going to record uh, tomorrow. Uh, so for this serial position effect, the reason I want to talk about it is I'm going to use it for an example uh, in lots of other cases. So we're going to use this serial position effect to talk about the modal model, to talk about the working memory model, to talk about some of the interference effects. Uh, so we're going to come back to this example several times. You're all familiar with the example. You probably talked about it uh, in Psych 1000. So you've probably covered this, uh, this idea before. So briefly, we're going to give you a list of 20 or more words to memorize. You're going to learn this list of words uh, to the best of your ability, and then you're going to try to recognize those words on a, uh, on a quiz. You all have the link that comes next. Does everybody have a Google Forms link? Is that on your slide? Yes? OK, don't click on it yet or don't look on it. I'm going to show you some words. Don't look at the list. I want you to remember this list as well as you can. And then as soon as we're finished, go to that link and just quickly, yes or no, did you see the word? Uh, that should give us just enough time to finish up on time. OK, ready? We're going to go quickly. Cord, bottle, rod, pencil, fish, wheel, rock, shovel, Knife, jar, sponge, apple, feather, axle, frame, toaster, boots, hammer, battery. Write down the words you saw. Don't write them down. Go to this form here and select yes or no if you recognize the word as one you've seen. I think we've got just enough time to look at the data when you're finished, and then we'll talk about it uh, next week in class or on the online. Give everyone just two more minutes to go. It's 219. We're going to finish up just on time. Then we'll look at these data afterwards. Is anybody still answering? All right, so what we'll look at next time uh, is the data that we've collected, where you can start to see, of course, the serial position effect that you expected to emerge, which is lots of correct answers declining as we get to the middle, um, lots of incorrect answers. Uh, so we see a disagreement here in the middle, uh, and then we see more agreement at the end. So what we're going to see is this so-called serial position effect, where most of us are able to remember the words at the beginning at the end, stronger at the beginning, a little bit weaker at the end, and then a trough in the middle where performance uh, isn't quite as strong. Uh, let's look at that next uh, class that we meet, uh, and I'll discuss this online as well. Thanks for sticking around.